So we're back at AAA Live channel. So please follow, um, like, and subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook channels. So I'm here with our guest, Professor Sabina Murray from the English Department of the University of Massachusetts in Ham Amherst. So can you please give some greetings, Professor Murray, to our audience who are from the education sector and its stakeholders? Um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for inviting me to have this conversation. Uh, I think it's very important to look at creative writing in a way that connects with the larger frames of thought and dialogue that are happening in society. I consider my writing very political in that way. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, being an educator myself, it's always good to be reaching out to people through that perspective. So I'd just like to say thank you for having me and thank you to Professor Alcazar for bringing me here because yes. we're very, very, very old friends. And it's good yes. to be <laughs> I don't want to dwell into how old because I hope <laughs> that we will always be young at heart. <laughs> but yes, definitely a, a very much of a shared history through our uh, youthful times together. And so I, I think we really have to begin from the very beginning as to how, as a young person, you actually expressed interest and if and when did you actually decide that you were wanting to be involved in the field of creative writing? Uh, a part of me, I think creative writing was what I always wanted to do without realizing it was a field. Yes. I mean, we, we express ourselves by telling stories. And as yes. you know, I was always an avid storyteller. Exactly. Um, exactly. And then, you know, you come to this point where your interests aren't so much just, you know, making people laugh or as I spent a, a significant part of my growing up times in the Philippines, I really got started um, telling ghost stories. Yes. That is really <laughs> where I got started. Uh, and it mm -hmm. was good training because yes. you would have to really um, uh, just change things up and keep moving in your dialogue and mm -hmm. uh, working on the entertainment aspect. Mm -hmm. So as I got older, I became more interested in histories and the way that certain histories excluded narratives. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of muscle uh, mm -hmm. started to be developed alongside this desire to entertain people, to create yeah. modes of communicating these important ideas um, mm -hmm. kind of in a sugar-coated way where yeah. someone could be yeah. sitting and entertaining themselves and wanting to turn the pages. But at the end of that, perhaps, yeah. perhaps their mind is changed or they've pursued a different um, way of thinking. So about what sort it. of like um, experiential learning skills and competencies do you think like uh, young people should involve the, themselves in, um, in developing, exploring, or, you know, really developing this interest if, if they would like to be in the field of creative writing? Because you were mentioning about like your experiences, even as a child, like ghost stories and trying to make it like entertaining in terms of like your story style and skills. And then eventually finding a bridge towards that kind of medium, which is creative writing. Uh, I think well, what's also very important is, you know, to read attentively. If you mm -hmm. like, if you like reading fiction, to try to step outside just that that moment of enjoyment, that moment of being entertained and really try to see what the writer is doing on the page and how it's happening. Mm -hmm. Because the first thing in, in creative writing is you have to have something to say that isn't exactly. out there already. Um, yes. You have to be able to get this kind of um, logical framework for what comes mm -hmm. to you is this amorphous mm -hmm. idea or this feeling or a reaction. And then you have to really figure out how to break that down into sentences and mm -hmm. chunks of narrative that interact with each other um, in a way that passes time on the page. So mm -hmm. the first thing I would say is if you wanna be a creative writer, the first inkling you're gonna have that maybe that's the direction for you is to really be intrigued by writing books, um, by reading books, because- Yes, so it begins with reading people, actually. Yeah, a, a lot of people are really love reading and then they think they want to be a writer, but mm -hmm. they just really want to be a reader. You have yes. to be intrigued by the formal aspects of it. And if you're mm -hmm. triggered in that way to think about the formal aspects of it, you know, that's mm -hmm. really the first step to figuring out what you need to do, the tools you need to do to keep going. 
Yeah. And so we were talking about our experiences like growing up um, in the Philippines and also having that cultural heritage of, of the Philippines. So how do you think that informed and influenced um, your writing and specifically also tie it to like our educational policy of using English as a medium of expression, if not of scholarship in the Philippines? Uh, well, it, it's in, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my timeline, which, you know, um, April, but I I came to the U uh, to the Philippines from Australia, and I yes, came exactly. not understanding any Tagalog at all, having yes. a Filipino mother who only would speak to me in English, even though I was kind of intrigued by learning this mm -hmm. other language. And I came at 12 years old and was enrolled in what was then Marinol, which is now Miriam, right? Yes. I and just went straight into that, and I could do it because the classes were in English. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But the moment you walked out of the classroom, nobody had any interest in pursuing English at all. And yes. it had this weird way of kind of splintering. It kind of, in, in a way, it acted as a framework for my own identity, that mm -hmm. there were two aspects to my identity, one which was this English speaking one, which yes. was, you know, in this, in this sense, this very white dominated mode yes. of education. Construct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The construct of it. And then when you leave the classroom, you're in this much more powerful in a way, natural social identity where people don't want to speak English and they want to explore their narratives in, in ways that they, uh, that they, they connect with family and culture. It's and a country. cultural environment, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what that did for me with me is it kind of fractured my, it fractured my processing of situations where mm -hmm. I've always felt like I could be in a situation, but I was always kind of observing too. I was always mm -hmm. a little on the outside, but mm -hmm. not completely. Spectator, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's spectator. And, you know, having, my father was an anthropologist and knowing this idea of the participant bystander, which he would always exactly. say to me, I was like, okay, high school's weird. I go to classes and I totally know what's going on. And then I walk out of the classroom and I'm completely confused. Because that's mm. a great position to be in because you're participating yeah. and you're, mm. you're getting, you know, I picked up, I did pick up quite a bit of Tagalog on the way and I can understand it. My speaking is terrible, but my comprehension is <laughs> not non-existent. But uh -huh. I was able to sort of have one foot in and one foot outside. Um, mm. And it made me very analytical about mm. the culture and how mm -hmm. people operated. Um, mm. But it also, because I wasn't completely outside of it, I have a very strong loyalty to mm -hmm. the Philippines as a nation, to my mm -hmm. family, who I am still very close to, and to mm -hmm. this part of my identity. You know, it's, it, just, it made me very um, aware of it. It wasn't just something that I grew up with and mm -hmm. naturally um, came to. I did construct this identity because of this mm -hmm. um, kind of being faced with it, uh, hitting up and, against it. Yes, and, and maybe that's like part of like that identity that it happened to you, as you've mentioned, during the formative years. Because as we know, all of our experiences uh, before we are 20 years old are really the most impactful to the rest of our lives, basically. Um, and, and so I think like, like part of that also is like, because you were looking at it from outside, looking in kind of as a spectator, as you said, you, you made your own construct for it to become a part of your identity, but never really fully being immersed in it as differentiated from someone who like literally grew up naturally like myself um, in it. So don't you think that the, these plants, the seeds of being a creative writer, of having a for example, a novel as a formal structure that you can fit into like the stories that you could potentially um, say or tell? I think that that's, that is truly accurate because you're always creating narratives around what's happening and who you are. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're not fully immersed in it, those are the things that are going to trigger you to try to create understanding. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Yeah, so definitely. Uh, but also because I was in the... Philippines for all of high school. Yes. My semester of college. And then I went to the US. Mm -hmm. And in the US, they, they saw me as a complete foreigner. 
When I was in the Philippines, everybody was just like, well, she's sort of like, the, she's this American Australian sort of thing with the Filipino. I don't know what the heck she is, but she's that, right? And okay. she's doing her thing. So I just always thought of myself kind of like, you know, being a foreigner is not a terrible thing. And I, was, really. and, you know, I had friends and I was fine. I liked my school. After a while, I got used to it. I was into it. Um, and then when I went to the U.S., they, they were just so unaware that mm. there was anything that we shared. There, I didn't understand American culture. I had never lived there. I didn't mm. understand their values. Um, and they, they, they didn't understand why family was so important to me, why I, I missed my cousins. That just seemed odd to them. Yes. And they had very specific values that I didn't share at all. So then mm -hmm. I got hit with another thing. I'm like, these people don't accept me as an American. I go back to the Philippines. I'm not really accepted as a Filipino. The whole time mm -hmm. I was growing up, I wasn't really accepted as an Australian because my dad was American. And yes. my mother was just yes. like, she was very dismissive of Australian culture and very vocally about it. Yes. <laughs> unapologetically. Yes. Filipino. Um, <laughs> yes. I was never, I was never um, really connected with anything. And it put me in a very unique position to try to figure mm -hmm. out how to bring all these different threads of my identity together. I mean, mm -hmm. even now in the US, they don't really consider me an American, which I think mm -hmm. would really surprise a lot of the people I went to high school with. Like, she's something else. <laughs> okay. And, and so you come to America and you know, you have all of this construct about like white people for example and, and American culture and how you would eventually like try to fit in because you've decided that you were going to come and be in the United States and this was already when you were 20 years old 21 years old right having gone through like the formative years outside of the United States so again were there again seeds that were planted in you because just like what happened to you in Australia and the Philippines again you're an outsider looking in yeah, I was again, I was right? put in that position, but I was also um, the casual racism in the U.S. towards mm -hmm. Asian people and the dismissive attitude towards Filipinos, which can happen, not always. Yes. It was very offensive to me mm -hmm. and it made me want to write about the Philippines. Mm -hmm. It made me want to show people that, you know, maybe every culture has its problems, but you can't yeah. dismiss out of hand a culture as a particular, as an inferior creation. Mm -hmm. And especially having spent those formative years in the Philippines, I had that kind of a, a kind of a disdain for certain aspects of American culture mm -hmm. that I yeah. can't. It, it's just it's in you. Yes. You know, it's in you. So, yeah, it really motivated me mm -hmm. to want to write about colonialism, to want to write about, you know, like truer representations of certain aspects of Filipino-ness that they, that I think really, really uh, needed to be out there um, in the U.S. Yes. And so having gone through, like, I think the realization of all of this sociological construct of like race, culture, nationality, um, was it natural progression that you will eventually end up in the academic community as possibly um, an environment where this uh, ideas, concepts, and profession can thrive for you in terms of a career trajectory? I think the university is a great place for me because, it's, you know, like universities are kind of like little embassies. Yes. They don't really exist in the culture. They're, you know, I have a lot of friends from different places and the people who are very much of the culture go to a university because they want to be bombarded with different kinds of ideas. Yes. So it is a place where I definitely... Um, enjoy being and you're because as I'm kind of like as a writer I'm kind of a magpie you know I don't have a field of study so if people ask me what do you write I'm like it's mostly post-colonial and I yes. know a little bit about narrative theory I know a little bit about post-colonialism but really mm -hmm. I get a lot of my material just from conversations with people who send me exactly. in different directions you know who will mention an aspect of history that I'll want to follow up on so mm -hmm. in that way um, I don't know if I'd be happy outside of academia doing what I do. I know mm -hmm. there are many writers who don't teach. They would rather do other things because they think that, you know, it's their creative capital. They don't want to put it out there into a classroom. It, you know, they get mm -hmm. depleted by it. But I actually think that um, as a writer, if you're going to support yourself, 
academia, unless you're going to be a best-selling author and there are maybe 2% of writers can support yes. themselves with writing, yeah. um, academia is actually a natural route and you'll teach literature courses along with creative writing courses. Um, mm. And it, yeah, so... And, and so um, being in the academic community, you have your um, students definitely. And how do you find the pedagogy or the methodology of teaching to maybe expose them potentially as a mentor um, to the possibility of becoming a creative writer themselves? Well, we have different approaches to this. And my approach is a little different to many of my colleagues or many people who teach creative writing. So the yeah. building block of teaching creative writing is the workshop mm -hmm. where people write creatively, they come yeah. in, they represent their work and it's critiqued by the group. Mm -hmm. um, and it has, it's definitely has its strengths, which is mm -hmm. you can get reactions from lots of different people. Exactly. It, right? Yeah. But you have to be very careful because it can also homogenize a yes. work because when you have all these different people's opinions, they kind of shave off, the original, they can shave off the originality Your group of, thing in psychology. Yeah, it can, it can create an aspect of groupthink into mm -hmm. um, art, which is, yeah. I mean, it's really good when people don't understand the work and it means that the writer has to go back and work harder to be understood. Understood, <laughs> yes. Right? You know, it's not the reader's job to work super hard to understand what's happening in a story because the element of yeah. entertainment always has to be there. But mm -hmm. so that's the one aspect of it. The other aspect that I like to think of is just, it's very kind of old world. It comes, you know, and I think it was Plato who said, expel all the poets. Mm -hmm. He wanted all the poets out of Athens because he thought that they introduced these kind of subversive realities. And he believed yeah. in this essential reality that was being yeah. undermined. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have, you know, Aristotle comes in and says, no, we need this. Because what you need is the reality that exists, yeah. that's mm -hmm. mostly believed in. And then yeah. you need people to come and introduce another thing. And then mm -hmm. the people who come out of this understanding of the generalized reality, and then are faced with this more discourse based art form, mm -hmm. have to balance the two against each other. And it's kind of dialectical. They come up with their own thinking. So in a free society where um, you're encouraged to think independently and develop opinions. You art becomes your own track, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're supposed to yeah. make your own track if you become a critical thinker, even if you had yeah. all of these experiences, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what I try to do is we have this workshop model where people just want to write and they want to have their work read. And, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll ask my students, what do you do before you write? And they'll say crazy stuff like, I light a candle. I go for a walk and, you know, every now and then the students will say, I think, but a lot of this idea of creative writing is that, you know, it's like you, inspiration is being beamed down to you. And then you just kind of are conduit into your computer. I'm like, yeah. no, so my teaching of creative writing, a lot of it has to do with, you know, let's think about, you know, what do you know about, you know, South Africa, for example, and they'll say, oh, what I've learned from Nadine Gordimer or Kosia, they'll come up with writers, fiction okay. writers, or, okay. you know, what do you know about Regency England? And they'll be like Jane Austen or Victorian England. It's always like, well, Dickens, the writers create the past yeah. for us. The writers create Actually, the there's present. History. <laughs> yeah. There's history. <laughs> The history of it, that's what we remember. And they create, you know, what, why you would remember what you read in a book by Coetzea over the news that you read every day about what may or may not be happening in South Africa is largely because we remember we are people and our consciousness, our memories are constructed through narratives and people. Mm -hmm. So what the creative writer does is they distill all that information and then they represent it to you through mm -hmm. lives. Yeah. That's what I do as I take all the information and then I present to life and it sneaks into people's minds and it presents an acceptable, believable um, mm -hmm. kind of, uh, I don't, 
fulfilled, smoothed narrative that makes sense. Because so, it is the construct, right? That, that makes it impactful on people and makes it responsive and relevant and empathetic to where they are. So, so now let's discuss, for example, in the great tradition of like those novelists that you mentioned, specifically for the Philippines, you take like Dr. Jose Rizal, our national hero. Why was he supposed to have been a revolutionary because he wrote these novels that actually ignited the passion of the Filipino people to want to agitate against Spanish colonialism, right? So, so I think if you look into that particular thread of where we could have like gotten this kind of like um, tradition, then we could really try to see the impact of novels. As you said, it's a construct of a narrative um, of people who might share this specific understanding. So, so how do you perceive now, as you've mentioned, do you see necessarily that your writing is political just because you draw on like the political history of, of the Philippines? Uh, anything, it's impossible to write without being somewhat political. I draw, the, what I get from the Philippines is really just building on the work of others like like Rizal yes. because when you're working from a colonial perspective or the perspective of the colonized people all you have is your stories and it's not just it's saying no what you're saying about where we are and what we're doing and the direction that we're supposed to be headed as a country is wrong and I'm mm -hmm. going to present this alternative which may be made up but yes. it actually bears some real guidelines for what is going on and how it might be done. Possibility. Yeah, at least. Always exists. So mm -hmm. when you have these places, and you see it in the Philippines with Rizal, and everybody, I mean, if you read Nick Joaquin, he's very political in his own way. He's like jabbing at people. He's using humor. He's mm -hmm. skewering the upper classes. He's hilarious, you know? Mm -hmm. And he really is very, very aware. So even if you're not doing something as overtly, as mm -hmm. potentially martyrly, as Rizal, mm -hmm. you're still doing something very political. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you compare uh, the Philippines, for example, with Ireland, where also their revolution, the, mm -hmm. the, um, the uprising of 1916 was mm -hmm. run by school teachers, linguists, poets. These are yes. all the people who had to bear arms because they yes. didn't have time. And this you see too. You know, yeah. like if I, my art will inspire the population to a position yeah. of subversiveness, sometimes there's no time. Like my art will inspire the people as I'm holding a rifle. Exactly. Right. So yeah. is it true that the adage that the pen is mightier than the sword? Because it's actually a call to action. Do you see that as a... Um, as the possible main, or not necessarily just the main, but one of the objectives maybe of the novel is a call of action to the people who read creative works. It definitely is. And just to alter, alter perceptions that are widely held. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just to circle it back to teaching, my class um, mm -hmm. for next semester, my seminar is contemporary migrant fiction in the U.S., yeah. Yes. And we're looking at everybody. We're looking, you know, we're looking at films. There was a film and just, you know, there are a lot of Filipino source material in there. The writer Leslie Tenorio has a wonderful book, Son of Good Fortune, about what it is to live undocumented in the U.S. Uh, yeah. as a Filipino. And then there's also a film, Yellow Rose, which is about an undocumented Filipino girl in Texas. Um, but then also just to bring in other people, you know, other cultures, what's happening in um a book, White Ivy, about what it's like as a Chinese American who doesn't want to live up to the academic aspirations of her family, who considers herself very ordinary and just wants to be rich. So yeah. it's, I think it's important in that class to just let my students see that this thing that they hold, which I'm, you know, the, the so-called truth of the American dream yes. in these books is being shown to be false. Mm -hmm. In these narratives about people from all different backgrounds, you know, like Pakistani, Indian, Filipino, Zimbabwean, a lot oh, of that. Yes. Many, yeah, it works to skewer this notion of the upward mobility that happens oh. when you hit America. 
So if the if your um, particular seminar, as you said, contemporary migrant literature um, or writing is like going to be now a reflection of what they actually see as being smack against the well white supremacist social construct of the country that is the United States. So isn't that also inciting a kind of call of action for for these groups of people because it is objecting and bringing out into the open um, those collective experiences and distilling it, as you said, in this narrative. It's saying that any discourse that you enter into, even if it's creative writing, can either participate with something that's happening or it can fight it. And you make that choice even in your art. I'm not saying that, you know, there's this uh, very, um, the term I guess is wokeness, which isn't completely correct. <laughs> it's in, yeah, it, because there's a lot of good that comes out of this awareness, but there's also, it has a backlash of just simplistic canceling out of dialogues. So yes. I'm a little careful. I think that in a moment where people are questioning the dominant modes of thought, that it's important yes. to, to, to um, engage in it with a level of sophistication. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so that's why we go back to the university being the ideal of a place of discourse, a place of exploring and investigating all sorts of like fields of study and, and knowledge and areas of possible discussion as a meeting place where this can all be openly um, discoursed, right? And yeah. with, thought about, and especially because you're at the University of Massachusetts, like the really the bastion, <laughs> the state at the very least, the bastion of what you would say as liberal thought in the United States. So, so how that makes a logical progress in terms of like you being in the academic community and specifically for like creative writing as a possible avenue for critical thinking at the very least. And so when you talk about like woke literature, it's actually consciousness raising, awakening like people who have not thought or, or been aware about uh, questioning, right? Uh, this alternate, this reality, and and giving them an alternative reality in the form of literature. Yes. No. I I, I think that it also. I think uh, another part of um, all of that is very valid. I think another part of what my job is as a creative writing teacher is to read widely, and not mm-hmm. just to read the things that I think will interest me. Yes. To read in a way that I'm aware of everything that's being said, well, Mm -hmm. as much as is possible. So that when I present to my students, I can say, you know, I am, I am being open to having my mind changed and having my set ideas about things altered because I want to always be aware of the power of fiction to change. So a huge part of my job also is just reading widely. And when a student, you know, let's say, you know, second generation Puerto Rican student is trying to write a family saga saying, look at these four books, Yes. right? I have to be able to say that. I can't just say, well, I'm sorry, I'm only reading modernists and I've been on this Henry James kick for the last two years and I have no idea what you should read. I can't do that. Yes, exactly. Okay, so so I think moving from like, you know, that career trajectory that you took from both the creative writing perspective and then also going into the academe and and really becoming like a possible mentor um, to those who would eventually um, have these outcomes in terms of like creative works now. So what sort of like advice, if you can, because we're already possibly at this age of our lives when we can dispense some advice (laughs) Um, to young people if they were so inclined to your well, field of study or creative writing, what sort of like um, skill sets, experiential learnings should they actually be exploring or looking into and potentially have a career trajectory as uh, what you have mentioned possibly in the academe as a possibility for them? So the most, I just, I'll come from the top and then I'll work my way back. To get a job in academia, you need to have 
a degree and mm -hmm. a published book. Yes. Um, in the old days, you only needed the published book. Now they want you actually to have maybe, you know, to show some ability to teach the work, yes. to have an idea about it. So that, that would be the top goal. So how do you write your book? First of all, what I'm doing when I have my graduate students range in age from about 22 to 35. Okay. And they have, when they enter um, the program, they send in a writing sample. Yes. And we sit there and there, we get hundreds of these things and we winnow it down to 10. And a lot of it just is in skill, the, the beauty and skill of spinning together sentences, word choice, understanding the power of language. That's a part of it. But I also add to that having something to say. Okay. So I believe that everybody has something to say. But if you can say that articulately and in an aesthetic way, that's what will get you into a graduate program that will give you the degree. So how do you get that? That tracks back to, now we're an undergraduate. Exactly. Um, I would say taking lots of literature courses and mm -hmm. understanding how to argue about books because yes. you'll be arguing with yourself about your own book. Yes. Um, and also, so if you really are interested in writing, it's important that you choose a field of study that's gonna let you really expand into that. So some people might say, well, that would obviously be English. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time it is, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's not, it's not necessarily. Mm -hmm. No, if you, Stop. if you're writers, for instance. Yeah. So, you know, maybe you're, you have a very philosophical muscle that really wants to be exercised You take philosophy. And if you keep reading fiction, that might give you what you need to go forward. Mm -hmm. um, if you really are interested in history, and I'm like, I'm self-taught in history, but what I did take as an undergraduate was I took art history, mm -hmm. which is just looking at paintings, but so much of how we remember events in history is actually contained in these paintings exactly. and what they signified in the culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I always have some painting, mm -hmm. like literally people painting or looking at paintings. I haven't had a book ever that doesn't have the major pivotal moments tied to these artists. So that was, yeah, that was my undergraduate was art history. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are kind of the tra career trajectories that you mm -hmm. have to take. And just mm -hmm. constructing fiction, trying to get it published in magazines, trying to um, complete book length work. So collections of stories and novels so that when you get out of graduate school, you can go on the market. As I said, it's a terrible term, but that's what they call it. Yes. We have a degree and a book. Yes, exactly. And so specifically, I think this is a possible concern for like the young generation because you also have like this digital technology that's come into our life. Um, so how do you see that like playing out? Because now you have fan fiction, you have um, Wattpad, you have these other formats that are available in a digital space. Um, so how do you think that plays out in terms of like the articulateness, the expressiveness, or the aesthetic for this younger generation who might not actually perceive the printed form as their mode of expression? Well, I mean, there are many different forms digitally, of course, but um, even these, and I, I think mostly having digital accessible easily disseminated books is, and writing is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have a Kindle and I carry it around with me and it has hundreds of books on it. Um, I, my book, all, my books usually are distributed through Kindle and they, they do well in the electronic format. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just about the books. But what, what all of this media has done is it's given people many different venues to get their work out there other mm -hmm. than sending a story to a print magazine, having an editor look at it and then sending it out. Um, roughly half my stuff that isn't books. And I mean like short stories, essays, all of that um, appears in online, um, in online forums. And the reason I like that is 
if somebody, it's a, you know, you do an interview like this and then somebody's like, oh, I'm interested in her work. You can just go to my website. You can read a bunch of my work. You know, maybe I'm not going to get 50 cents per read or something, but ultimately the larger goal is to connect with readers. So mm -hmm. I think, and especially for writers trying to get started, getting mm -hmm. some stuff online is just, it's a fantastic thing to do and any kind of writing. A book review that you do on, you know, Goodreads, I don't know, I'm sure you can join in the Philippines, but, you know, if you're on Goodreads and you write a good book review, that could get you um, attention mm. by in another source for book reviewing, which is another way to get some income as a writer. Um, so all of these things are actually, uh, I think they're pretty good. Um, yeah. Also, podcasts have taken mm. over from radio. You know, we used to talk about old times when nobody watched TV and instead they listened to the radio. This is your modern day podcast, right? Yeah. Exactly. So, so, but having said that, digital technology is not a substitute or a replacement from like the very bedrock of what like creative writing is, which is what we've been discussing from the beginning of this discussion, right? That they still have to really read widely, that's one. And then yeah. they have to identify a kind of like possible narrative format that they would probably utilize in order to tell the story and in, in an aesthetic form <laughs> that makes it like compelling and interesting, right? So, so I think maybe that's what um, needs to be realized by, by students who potentially would want to become creative writers, that it isn't enough that there's a digital space out there. No, that's, yeah, to interact with the, the kind of the, um, the power base yes. in writing, getting your stuff really out there, you do require a publisher and whatever mm -hmm. format they choose, it acts as it's um, curated. Mm -hmm. And you can get the reviews. Memorial yeah. team, right? Yeah. So, so I think maybe that's like part of what they um, needs to be realized, right? That you really have to backwardly integrate and say that this is kind of like the skill sets that learning that I really need to have in order yeah. to become a creative writer and the digital technologies, but a tool, as you said, effective in terms of accessibility now, but not a replacement or a substitute for, for the substance of what creative writing is all about, which brings us now to like your um, book that will be coming out in August, and specifically this touches upon the Philippines again. Um, is it correct to say that this is kind of like a book end to what started when you were like a young person, and now I would say a more informed, mature, creative writer going back full circle to the Philippines? I think it definitely is. It's a more mature work. I. I wrote it because I really wanted to express a political position in a way. Yes. I really wanted to do that. Um, so I wasn't so, when I wrote this book, I wasn't very inspired. This is the most, you know, seat of the pants on the chair and just give yourself your four hours at your computer and don't leave till you have five pages. This book was the hardest for me to write in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because, because really there's an angrier tone compared to being a young person. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, it's combined with the fact that now I kind of, I've spent so many years as a writer that I really do see that it's powerful. And I do see that people interact with the text and it can change minds. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, this book hasn't come out yet. Human Zoo hasn't come out yet, but there are reviews up, um, online from people who got early copies of the book. And, uh, you know, a lot of them just say little things like, wow, I learned a lot about Philippine history. And I'm surprised mm -hmm. at that. It's a short book. Um, yes. And then I feel like job done, good. You thought about it. You mm -hmm. thought about a country that you would not otherwise have thought about. Okay. So, so would it be fair to say that following, again, the footsteps of Dr. Hazeri Sal, the romanticism of Noli Metangere as against the political construct of El Filibusterismo at two bookends, 
to maybe like the same <laughs> the same but it's a, it's a very nice romantic ideal <laughs> notion <laughs> <laughs> correct <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean it really was very funny to me because i did write human zoo and i'm thinking back to this book i wrote when i was i was 20 years old which mm-hmm. was slow burn that came out and there's actually a newer edition that Santo Tomas UST Press brought out like three years ago. Um, and but I really, I think I the same stories. Yeah, but it was not revised. It was still the original text. It was still the original right. text. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, have I written exactly the same book? It's It could be the same person aged somewhat going back and having, and of course, you know, the, the political situation in the Philippines has shifted and has so many dramatic elements to it that do, that have changed since then. So it's not the same book in that way, but perhaps. The character is the same person in the same way that the writer or the spectator or even the reader would have been like different because it was a different milieu when you're 20 years old and when you're now so much older. <laughs> yes, we won't say how much older. <laughs> yes, we won't say how much older. <laughs> Yeah, so so exactly um, like what we're saying that um, these narratives and, and creative writing is actually a reflection of a milieu, which is possibly a reflection of an author, the reflection of the events that could have transpired during that time. And then eventually, how do you, as, as you said, pull back all of these elements, put it together, distill it? and come up with what is like a compelling, aesthetically, um, I think, powerful story. I think that's true. And there's the one other element is that, you know, the writer has to have an original voice. Yes. The voice in when you're writing is like, a, it's like a fingerprint. Mm-hmm. So my work is wildly different. And I write about very many different things. But it, if you know my work, if you picked it up, and you're reading in the middle of the book within a paragraph, you would know it was mine. Yes. So it's your voice is really what you work on too. You know, how is this, how, why are you the only person who could write this book? So finding that voice, I think is like, don't you think that's like a, a lifelong, <laughs> lifelong ambition for all of us? <laughs> it, you know, it, voice kind of happens when you're working on other things. Mm-hmm. But when you feel you're writing in a, in a strong vein, it generally means that you're you're nailing it using your voice. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, these are all also ultimately, you know, you practice a lot. If mm-hmm. I haven't been writing every day because life gets in the way or I have a lot of teaching to do, mm-hmm. when I sit down to write, I'm not as quick at editing my own work. Mm-hmm. I'm like, maybe that word's okay. Or yeah. maybe that sentence belongs there. Or I don't know how to get my character to wake up in the morning because passing time is really hard at the beginning of a paragraph. And you're like, Ooh. if you're writing every day, I'm just like, okay, that word's terrible. It goes, this sentence, I just wrote two paragraphs that don't go anywhere in the text, delete. Okay, let's get her up. And it's so much easier. So if there's almost like a muscle memory that also happens when you're writing consistently and well. So that's something right. else. You it has that. to be um, what has to be realized by students of creating writing is just like any other field of study or discipline there is a discipline to being a writer as you said if you've been writing like consistently every day your muscle memory of writing is like flexed (laughs) as compared to like you're not been writing for a while and so you kind of like have to get your momentum kind of going so it's definitely a lot of hard work. So we hark back to the image of the writer being like a lonely hermit that they have to like stay in their room and not be bothered by, by anyone because they're writing. <laughs> Correct? You can be right because you have to hold so many facts in your head. You have to hold all the facts of all your characters. Mm-hmm. So it's if somebody walks into a room and you're, it can really be very disturbing, but at the same time, I, I, I kind of resist this idea of writers being kind of these romantic figures who are just, I mean, we are just making stuff up, but really successful writers understand. Yeah, I understand. I go to my writing desk, like 
other people go to work. I don't wait for inspiration. If I waited for inspiration, I'd have half a book at this point. Mm-hmm. You have to just go in at it as if, you know, if you were a cook, you would start chopping vegetables. If you were a bricklayer, you'd get your, you know, cement going. You really just have to think about yourself in this very prosaic down to earth mm-hmm. way, because if you, if you, think that what you're doing is elevated, then when you write is going to have no substance. So you're not waiting for Holy Spirit to come down. <laughs> not for this purpose. Not for this purpose. Definitely not. <laughs> okay. So I think we've had some really, really uh, fruitful discussion. Maybe um, you'd like a little blurb preview about the human zoo to our Filipino audience about uh, what they should be looking forward to in August when you come out with the book. I have, I have the picture of the book. I don't know if you've seen the cover. Yes, please. This is the cover. It's, yes. it's Ronald Ventura, who yes. I love, He's a contemporary Filipino painter. Um, mm-hmm. The book is really... This is kind of a crazy way to come at it. It's, I really wanted to write something that felt real about what it might be like to live under the contemporary political regime from the perspective of someone just coming in for a while. So I think what other people have said about the book is it, has, it moves very quickly. It has a thriller aspect to it. Um, it has a lot of family. It has romance. Um, it has all of that. But... With this book, what I was really trying to do was make it seem like you were peering through a window, watching this person just move through. And somehow at the end of it, you had a knowledge, a different knowledge about what was going on in this city. Mm -hmm. So I I hope that people pick it up because they want to know what happens to the character. Yes. And so do you think that this is going to be insightful in terms of like a call to action in the same way that slow burn so many years ago um, was kind of like uh, and well I would say a call to action to move forward having come from a like a fractured history and now coming full circle that did we really move that much forward um, again to to try to revisit that same call of action so many years ago. Absolutely. And, and I also, I just wanted to kind of gently introduce into the, the, the nature of complicity mm-hmm. in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a political climate that is really just oppressing and targeting people that even if you're not really affected by it, and even if you know it's wrong and you don't support it, if you're running through your life normally, kind of alongside this stuff, you are in a way complicit. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's what the book is really about complicity. Mm -hmm. And if people can live with that by not being in a position to do anything or not putting one out there to do anything, then maybe that is when the call to action at the very end of the book, if that is going to be the takeaway from the book, that someone who hasn't been thinking about it, someone who might be complicit by not doing anything about it, and at the end of the book, you are woke. You have been awakened to think about undertaking a call to action, then the creative writer yourself would have like achieved your objective. Yes. And I'm going to loop this back to the beginning. We're talking about audiences. You were talking about English versus uh, Filipino in the classroom and elsewhere. I write mostly for, I don't write for an American audience, but I am mostly read by an American audience. Mm -hmm. And that puts me in a position of power in some ways. You know, my last, nearly every book, I think every book I've written has been reviewed in the New York Times book review. The last Mm -hmm. book was, you know, best pick of the New York Times book review. The Caprices, which had a lot of Filipino subject matter in it, won an award. I have Mm -hmm. to be very humbled by that. I have to be aware of my ability to reach people. And that made me think, oh, I wrote this in a hurry. I went to Manila um, for Vice Magazine. I wrote an article on why uh, the current president is so popular. I was curious. 
I wanted to know why. I interviewed a lot of people. And then after that, I was like, great, I wrote this article in Vice and now it's gone. I need to do something else. And mm-hmm. what I can do is I can just take all of these elements and I can say, look, is this acceptable? That mm-hmm. this ha- that you know, extrajudicial killings affect people without due process? Is that mm-hmm. acceptable? You know, when you look at these things, is, is it acceptable? So that's really kind of what I'm trying to do with the human zoo was you have statistics and, you know, you have a, what is that? You know, a, a million people dead is a statistic. This is Stalin, right? One person dead is a tragedy. Yeah. I had to say, okay, what I can do as a writer is to take the, you know, 20,000 dead EJK, EJK victims and I can make it one person. And I made it one person. So exactly. And, and so um, we go back to what you were saying that your writing is like political. So if that's going to be the context of what you were saying, again, if by the end of the book, the takeaway for the reader is that there is now a call to action, whether that's going to be an individual or a collective, just like when we go back to Dr. Jose Rizal's writings, <laughs> right? Then again, yeah. You can then um, say that and characterize your writing as being political, because if that leads to political action, then you go back to the discourse being like the seminal moment when people are woke and they, they become awakened and become conscious. If it hasn't been staring at them in, uh, at its face, right? Probably they were staring at it. They were just not made aware of it. <laughs> exactly in such an impactful way as was narrated, as was um, t- told as a story in, in your novel, then possibly that's how you would then truly characterize your, um, your writing as political, right? Yeah. <laughs> and yes. especially because you were saying like you're writing for an American audience, if we reach the point when this novel could be taken by the power base, who has influence in policy, American policy precisely, then it's possible that they could create a fire, uh, a firestorm. Hopefully a firestorm. Also, you know, I'm writing about the Philippines. I'm, I'm, I'm the right person to write Human Zoo. I'm definitely the right person to write Human Zoo. And that's why we're talking about the voice, right? Your voice. There are so many other stories that should come out of the Philippines that people are actually on the ground. People who want to write, you know, in whatever, whatever they want to write in, they should have that, you know, I'm not saying that I can represent the whole country or that I know more than Filipinos who are living in Manila all the time. Yes. I don't. I can only write this one story. But yes. I also hope that what it does is it creates an interest to read these stories by people who are more capable of writing expansive, um, interesting, uh, dramatic exposés that I can't write. I -hmm. hope that it will make those books appealing to an American audience and make them want to pick them up. So I want to put that in there. I'm not trying to speak for for Filipinos. I'm in a very weird, um, I, I am outside the culture in many ways and I'm inside it in some ways too. But I just really uh, hope that if the fact that the Human Zoo got a major American publisher, you know, it has a good review in Publishers Weekly, um, they're printing a lot of books. I would like that to inspire other Filipino writers to come on board and start getting their stuff out there because I think I think that it's really, really important um, just in expressing uh, what's happening in the country. Mm-hmm. And, and to say, as I've mentioned to you, like that kind of voice um, is still not heard in the Philippines precisely because of the language divide. Uh, it's difficult to access an audience um, outside of English um, writing because then it is not trickled down to like a lot more people, right? It's going to be contained to an audience who is able to actually be privileged enough to access because of the English divide that exists in the Philippines, right? So yeah, so I I think precisely this political writing um, that is characterized in, in your writing may be targeted towards those who are in a position of 
potential policy making and influence so that they could really start to maybe as again a call to action um, to really try to see how and when it's possible to affect change, right? Yes. But also, I mean, if somebody did want to translate this book into Filipino or Tagalog or run it as, you know, when I think about when, I, when I'm in the Philippines and I'm riding around in, you know, taxis and they always have the soap operas going in the car. Every time you go in there and you're always like, oh, she got stuck in Saudi and then she became a, a singer and then she was rescued, right? I'm always listening to this in the, in the taxis. And it does occur to me, you know, if someone could take a book like this and translate it into you know, the lingua franca and have it as a soap opera in taxi cabs, I would actually really like that. Like right. that would be, be, that would be a good direction. That would be fiction moving no, to its highest purpose, mm. not its lower purpose, but its highest to purpose. Be, to, be yeah. <laughs> to make people conscious and aware and potentially educate them to become like, more critical thinkers. Yeah. So, so I think we've really run through the gamut of like the process that needs to be undertaken to become a creative writer. The learning that may be the objective of what creative writers would like to achieve and maybe a career trajectory in the academic community for those who aspire <laughs> to potentially become creative writers. So Thank you so much to Professor Sabina Murray for that very fruitful discussion. And I hope that um, to our stakeholders in the education sector that you would have like taken away so much from our discussion.